truth about the news media is that we don't care that much about the economy, but what we should care about is what people do, what interests people. And what interests people are probably personalities, prices, and politics. And I'm talking, you know, as a, as a, news, as a newsman and not as a media analyst. Um, but to get to your actual questions, and I had listed them here, I'm going to start with the last one first. Uh, in other words, does the media have a vision for South Africa's economic development? And it has been said already that no, it's, it's impossible. Uh, the news media is not homogenous. There may be some strands that are common, but really we are different, and, and I think that will be reflected. Or the, you know, the news media is different. Uh, by the way, I say news media because media is everything. Media is TV and and, and radio and films and books and we must actually be, if I, if I have to be academically pedantic, specific about the news media. The first point about the news media having a vision and the second thing which I think Mondi mentioned is the news media is dynamic and operates within a rapidly changing environment. As in the States this is um, seen newspapers decimated actually in, in a process that probably makes them stronger as they face the future by by internet publications. And so you have to take that into account. And what I mean by that is that they're not unchallenged as means of delivering whatever they deliver. There are other avenues now. Um, the traditional news media is not unchallenged. And then I must get on to some fallacies of news media analysis, um, which I particularly <coughs> find people outside the news media make, which is a selective sample. In other words, discussing one article as evidence for views or two articles. So you'll get somebody that says, well, you know, the media is the news, the media, media's um, approach to the economy is dreadful. And if you ever look at this piece in the Mail and Guardian, it's one-sided and it only quotes the bank. You, got. you know, um, what I'm asking for is a bit more rigorous actual analysis. And part of that is, <coughs> um, and it has come up, is focusing only on the social responsibility aspect of journalism and neglecting the financial. In other words, the market aspect can really lead you astray. I mean, I've been in newsrooms, and I know the kind of pressures that we're under. And I've been in newsrooms, particularly the, I used to work for the Weekly Mail. Um, I, I, in fact, I worked freelance for the Weekly Mail in the days when it was still an alternative newspaper. And there was a single salary structure where the cleaner earned the same as the editor, literally. Um, and so it wasn't, you know, driven by commercial imperatives. But nonetheless, you're still faced with this problem of operating in a market environment and it is it's inescapable until we have government funding all right let me get on to the coverage of the economy you know this is the question of whether the news media covers how it covers the economy there's the fallacies here as well following from those is the fallacies of what news me media can and should do and one of the things is that news media organizations are in the business of entertainment as much as education in fact I would say that's the strength um, you know, I'm in an educational institution and I walk into a, a classroom full of students and they have to listen to me. Um, they can't really leave or they don't get their DP requirements and they fail. Um, unfortunately, the news media is very, there's, it's, there are uh, any number of distractions. When you write an article, you have to realize there are any number of distractions. Any number of exit points from your article. If you put in a big boring chunk in the middle there, you, you're giving somebody an excuse to stop reading. Um, you have to know these things as a professional. Um, and yeah, okay, so um, I've approached my, recently I've taken a, a slightly different approach to evaluating news media coverage. It's called appreciative inquiry and it's a very respectable academic approach which tries to look at what is working rather than taking the classic Cambridge critical approach. Try to look at what is working first before you break down. Try to build on what is working. And if I take that view, I think, well, you know, the news media actually is not doing too bad a job of covering the economy. Yes, there are problems. And you'll find that news people are, are the most critical of all. We criticize each other all the time, that's for certain. But, um, you know, who says we should do this or that or the other thing? I mean, why should we cover this or that? It's not a centrally plan planned economy, not yet anyway. Okay. And, and who is the news media? And I mean, I was just looking at the figures recently. You know, there are six, 655 consumer magazines in South Africa, 700 business-to-business -business print publications, 470 community newspapers and magazines. There are about 21, I think, daily newspapers, something like 24 major weekly newspapers now. There is a lot of competition out there. We should be 
able some way to find some reasonable coverage. The other fallacy is that of audience and media effects. And it's the idea that people, you know, that, that when you write something, it's directly injected into people's brains and they believe what you, you say. That's not how it works. People interpret what is broadcast and, and written in ways that are not necessarily intended and they're not stupid. Um, we have to realize that. Another point I want to make is creativity and knowledge is not spread equally among journalists and so that is why you get some of this terribly, terribly boring writing about the, the economy. However, I must say it has a long way to go before it reaches the academic level. Um, abstractions are not journalism. If I can come back to that point that as a business reporter, um, and journalistic discourse is not the same as academic or political discourse. Um, and I feel very strongly about that because I, I and I'll come to it in a moment, um, if maybe if I have time to flesh out what I think is, is really good reporting. And that maybe what we're thinking about when we're thinking of economic reporting is wrong. We should be thinking about it in terms of what is actually happening to people, small businesses, and there is that kind of reporting. But let me just make a few quick remarks about the economy. How am I doing for time then? All right. I mean, you know, um, how should we write about the economy? Well, I mean, there's the teleological view, which is espoused by Cassatu, um, you know, um, where everything is predictable. Basically, the result of the morass we find ourselves in is not the result of, you know, certain things not going our way. It's all the result of policy decisions that weren't made back in 96 or 94. So it's a view that your, what you do now is automatically going to happen in the future and that everything is predictable. And the world doesn't work that way. Also, there's an ethical um, implication here. Um, and I would prefer a deontological um, view of the morality that underlies the economy. In other words, when we're looking at the economy, we shouldn't be looking at what is it right to do now that will achieve an effect then? But what is right now? For instance, if we're looking at inequality, is it okay to have levels of inequality that we see in this? And I don't think it is. And what should we be doing immediately about that? Um, as opposed to saying, well, we have to put up with, a, with, with it um, so that you know, in future we can, we can have inequality. I, I don't think that's necessarily the answer. Um, um, so I, I think that we have to take a, a much more um, n a, 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 um, moral view. I, I believe in a, a normative view of the economy. But in discussing the economy, I mean, if, and I'm, I'm thinking very much of the Cassati document, it's top of my mind. Um, we have to avoid isms and, and portmanteau words that conceal as much as reveal, you know, like neoliberalism. And, you know, um, um, Fazili, you, you asked the question before is, you know, what kind of a job is the media doing um, about, um, you know, reporting on the economy? Well, clearly we haven't done a very good job because the same old myths are, are repeated again and again and again. And the one of them is that interest rates are high. Well, high how? High in relation to what? High in real terms? High in relation to Europe? How are they high? Um, it's a very real question which exercises not only economists, um, and there's a moral dimension to interest rates as well. If you have artificially low interest rates, you're actually beggaring people who put aside money in savings. Is that correct? <coughs> Some people would say it's fine. Uh, other people would say not. So there are moral dimensions even to that. Um, one of the things also I think in reporting about the economy that really irks me is the view that the state is the problem, first of all. And secondly, it's the answer to all problems. So as long as we get economic policy right, everything else will flow. As long as we get this, that, you know, yeah, well, I'm not sure about that. But together with that is the constant emphasis on regulation and new laws. You, need a, you have a problem, put in a new law. When, all, when we really know from experience that implementation is the issue. In fact, this is not unique to South Africa. I'm told that in Brazil, if you, um, if you want to stand for any office at any level, when you promise a new law, the result that Brazil has thousands and thousands of laws in a state of books that are never implemented, never meant to be. But they are, and you'll find that in other countries as well. Um, yeah, and along with that, a resistance to the idea that the private sector might actually have something to offer and the de depreciation of ordinary business. And I'm thinking about small business here. And then finally, pretending to speak on behalf of the poor. I mean, it's all very easy to say that you're pro-poor, you know. I'm also pro-poor, you know. 
particularly being now in an academic environment, it's made much <laughs> easier to be <laughs> pro poor. But <laughs> what does that actually mean? You know, I mean, does it mean writing endless stories about poor people? I mean, you'll find this is a kind of a poor pornography you find in some magazines, which is like pictures of people downtrodden with flies on their face. And, um, and I don't know who it's supposed to serve. Oh, and there's another version of that, which is happy black, happy, usually black and poor people, showing how they're coping with life's um, problems. Um, there must be another way, uh, you know. Um, and I think that that, that's the, that that is part of the challenge. And part of this sort of false consciousness of being pro-poor, I think, has added to our problems as a continent because we have the boners of the world going around telling everybody what a terrible place this is. So we have difficulty persuading people to invest here. You know, what does it mean for our brand, as it were? Internet? What does it mean about the way we feel about ourselves having this sort of false consciousness of probability. So what, and finally, what, what can news do? I mean, obviously, as journalism teachers, journalism educators, we think about these things all the time. We tell students what they should be do and what they shouldn't do. And what we tell them about business news is that, look, you have to humanize it. You have to find the human face. Okay, you've got to, when you write a business story, forget, a, don't forget about the figures, but find, find a person whom this affects and tell the story through that. And what that, does mean is you must be informed by in-depth knowledge because you cannot just rely on the anecdote. If you rely on the anecdote, then you can also be completely skewed. So you'll find one person who's given up their SUV because of the carbon tax, <coughs> and then you extrapolate a trend from that. That's not good. You have to have the facts as well. So it's statistics plus the humanizing, plus, you know, multi-sourcing is something we, you know, we, we try and insist. Try to, you're trying to arrive at a more verifiable, defensible method of the truth. This applies to all journalism. Um, and I think truly we can be truly developmental. In other words, instead of this false probe with stuff, we can actually try and find personal finance um, stories which actually are applicable to the poor, such as how do you choose a cell phone package if you're a poor person? And you know, there are magazines that have done. Bono has done that, has actually given people the means to navigate through those incredibly complex intentionally <coughs> complex packages that the cell phone companies offer. So, you know, that is a way, uh, a way we can do. And then, finally, specifics, and I'll mention this. Um, uh, Jana Maria, I think it is on the Business Times, wrote recently of um, a story which illustrates very, very, um, very well the problem that we have with trade. And this is that in Newcastle there are um, Chinese, and I think Taiwanese, clothing manufacturers who have threatened to close down their factories because they are being forced to pay the minimum wage. And recently, when the sheriff arrived to um, attach the assets of one of these factories, which had a judgment against it by the Labor Department, the workers stoned the sheriff's car um, and drove him away. And what that shows you is this, uh, the, the very real problem of our wages. In fact, I think that the report could go even further, and I think that the, the problem of wages in South Africa are not at the level of workers, quite frankly. I think they're at the level of management. In fact, I have some um, uh, information about that. I used to research the Chinese textile clothing manufacturers in, in Lesotho. But as I, once again, I say anecdote uh, should be backed up by data, and it would have made a much bigger story if, it, if we'd, we'd got some more... But it's much more interesting to go in on that level and illustrate problems with trade than to cover a presidential visit, which is dreadfully dull, and you know, people signing things. Um, uh, and, and by the way, on that point, there's, there's another fallacy that is repeated again and again, which is that a trade imbalance with a particular country is a problem. It's not a problem. problem. If we have a trade imbalance with China, if they sell us more stuff than we sell them, it's not a problem. The problem is the overall trade balance. If we're buying stuff from China, we probably need it. Okay? Um, what our problem is is the overall trade balance. If we had a surplus and we were buying stuff from China, it wouldn't matter. Okay. So finally, there are no barriers to entry in, in the news media, not yet anyway, um, except for money. But even then, with the internet, it's becoming, as, as Saxis knows, it's increasingly possible to get your message out there. And if you think you can crack it in the news market in covering business, well, that's it. Give it a try. Thanks very much.